Hello and welcome to The Game Changers, the podcast that celebrates trailblazing women in sport. I'm Sue Anstis and I'd like to start with a big thank you to our partners Sport England, who support The Game Changers through a National Lottery Award. I'm delighted to say that this, the 13th season of the podcast, is a serialisation of my book, Game On, The Unstoppable Rise of Women's Sport. Chapter 12, Sidelined Women. Sports are no different from business or politics, tech, you name it. It starts at the top. People hire people who they're comfortable with, who look like them. Male boards in business hire male CEOs. And in sports, male directors hire male coaches. Meredith Flaherty, University of Florida. Much of what I share in this chapter is relevant to women working in a variety of roles as officials, but I focus primarily on coaches. I hope to answer three questions. Why do we see so few female elite coaches? Why does it matter? What needs to change in the future? Sport England provides some interesting background Almost half of all sports coaching is being delivered by women, but less than half of them have any formal coaching qualification. Women in England are also much less likely than men to think of themselves as a coach. Around a third of coaches on England's talent pathway are women, yet just 11% of the coaches for Team GB at the Rio Olympics in 2016 were female. It's not a new phenomenon. As long ago as 1982, British sports councils were delivering specific interventions to increase the number of female coaches in the UK. It is a problem the world over. In the US, Title IX came onto the statute books in 1972 and transformed sports in the USA. It guaranteed no discrimination based on gender in any publicly funded institution ensuring girls have the same opportunities as boys in everything, including sport. This meant equal treatment on the playing field and equal funding for all their sports programmes. College or university sport in the US is like nothing we know in Europe. I remember my brother, Tim, studying sports medicine at the University of Virginia in the 1990s and telling us about the vast stadiums with crowds of 60,000 watching college football each week. At the time, I thought it was a big crowd if we had more than 100 people watching Loughborough University's men's rugby team playing on a Wednesday afternoon. Title IX had an extraordinary impact on the access to sport for girls in colleges across the US. As Susie Petrocelli explains in her powerful autobiography, raised a warrior, the thousands of sports scholarships available to young women resulted in a massive shift in participation. In the US, between 1972, when Title IX was passed, and 1991, when FIFA held the first official Women's World Championship, there was a 17,000% increase in girls playing soccer in high school, she reports. Sadly, The hugely positive impact Title IX had on sports participation did not extend to those women working in coaching. And in many cases, it has had a negative impact. In the late 1970s, over 90% of women's sports teams at colleges and universities in the US were coached by women. As Title IX drove money into women's sports, and it became apparent that coaching staff could be well paid for their work, this shifted dramatically. Today, it is only around 40%. This drop occurred from the 1980s to 2000, and it has stayed at about that level since then. With enormous crowds, TV rights and sponsors, college sports in the US is a $14 billion industry, and head coach is one of the most visible and powerful positions in sport. These people are equivalent to CEOs of big organisations, in charge of all the players and the huge backroom teams that support them. 
The top 25 head coaches in US college sport last year were paid salaries that ranged from $4.1 million to $9.3 million. Aside from the fact that women now only make up 40% of the head coaches in women's sport, in US men's college sport, only 3% of head coaches are women. In the same way that Title IX drew female sports participation in the US, globally, there has been a fantastic shift in gender balance in Olympic sports too. The IOC report that women made up less than a quarter of participants at the Summer Olympics in LA in 1984, but will be just under half, 48.8%, in Tokyo 2020-2021. Unfortunately, again, this does not extend to coaching, where gender imbalance has remained static since the 2010 Winter Olympics in Vancouver, with just 10% of accredited coaches now female. So why aren't we seeing more elite female coaches and officials? A fascinating US survey sheds light on the different beliefs in this area, which are true the world over. Male athletic directors at US colleges rank the three key reasons they believe prevent more women being head coaches. Number one, time constraints due to family. Number two, failure of women to apply. Number three, lack of qualified women. Female athletic directors suggest otherwise. They state the three reasons as being number one, success of old boy networks, number two, conscious discrimination during the hiring process, and number three, time constraints due to family. The women believe it is structural, but the men say it is the fault of the individual women. This highlights one of the key issues in many areas where we do not see women in leadership roles. There's a drive to fix the women, but it turns out women are not the problem. It's the system that needs to change. Blaming the people with no power in the system, the women, means that men don't need to question the system itself or even consider how much they personally might be part of the problem. They just blame the women. While it's fantastic to have programmes in place that attract and upskill female coaches and officials, and this needs to continue and receive more investment, it's not the definitive solution. You could have the greatest female coaches ever, but that won't change things or create equality. I asked Mark Gannon, the CEO at UK Coaching, what the organisation was doing to improve the numbers of elite female coaches. He told me, In many cases, women make better coaches than men. Women are generally people-focused first and foremost. They care about people and understand how to get the best out of them. It's not a matter of just attracting more women into coaching. It's the environment around coaching that we need to change. It's a systematic thing. Sports from their earliest amateur days have grown out of competition with the development of leagues and teams. To get your club or team included, you needed to step forward and get involved in the administration of these structures. It was men that took these roles because it was primarily men's sport. Many of those committees and councils and panels have remained primarily male for decades and this still impacts the appointment of coaches and managers today. Fortunately, things are changing with positive action on gender parity from Sport England and UK Sport with the Code for Sports Governance. But this drive for diversity hasn't yet reached into professional sport. The goal moving forwards will be to break the institutional mould that we have for traditional coaches. As Mark highlights, as with so much in life, sport is run by men and they have the power to make decisions and that includes appointing coaches and officials. One of the things that will lead to better gender balance at the top of organisations is more women involved in making decisions. This is homologous reproduction, where people automatically hire other people who look like them. It means that a dominant group, in this case the men, systematically reproduces itself by employing more men than women. 
Similarly, white people will automatically employ more white people. I'm familiar with the concept because, looking back, I can see it's exactly what I did in running my own sports PR agency for many years. I told myself we had a very open recruiting process and we did interview lots of young men. But in reality, the majority of our employees looked very much like me or like me 25 years ago. For many years, my team were all women and most had sports science degrees and a passion for communications. A number also attended the same university as me. A couple had even done the same course. I didn't see it at the time, but clearly I was exhibiting my own bias about who I felt would make the best appointee in just the same way as those appointing only male coaches and officials. For women who do make it through to the higher levels of coaching, gaining qualifications can be daunting. Women talk of turning up to coaching courses to find they're the only female in attendance. It takes some confidence to do this, which is what Giselle Mather, Director of Rugby at Wasps Ladies, has in spades. Giselle was the first woman to earn the RFU's Level 4 coaching qualification and oversaw the development of players such as Marlon Giard, Jonathan Joseph and Anthony Watson during her nine-year role at the London Irish Academy. I remember Giselle sharing a story in The Telegraph which highlighted some of the challenges female coaches face. When I was going for my Level 3, I had given birth to my daughter six weeks previously. I knew I was ready to take the level three and I remember ringing up the RFU, telling them that I had to bring my daughter because I was feeding. When you were doing your level three then, you did 24 hours where you stayed overnight. So I said, I need to bring her. If she screams, I will take her out. I appreciate if I fail as a result, so be it. It is my responsibility. The RFU rang me back and said, as long as you are discreet. I loved her response. I was like, yeah, I'm going to go woohoo in front of a hundred blokes. But she was fantastic. I put her in the papoose when I was doing all the things on the course. Casey Stoney, manager at Manchester United Women, says the same. If I go through my experience of every coaching course I've ever been on, I am the only woman in the room. Unless you are a strong person, it is daunting. It is absolutely daunting. Giselle and Casey are great examples of women who are unfazed by being in a room with a hundred men taking their coaching qualifications. Obviously not all women feel as self-assured though, as it was another decade in 2018 before the next woman after Giselle achieved the RFU's Level 4 coaching qualification. Another reason women haven't achieved the same levels as men in coaching is society's belief that men perform better at sport, which leads to an assumption that men are also better at being sports coaches or officials. I'm embarrassed to admit that I have been guilty of this mindset myself in the past. When I was growing up, There were times when I would have chosen a male coach or trainer because I'd assumed they would somehow be better than a female equivalent. Then there's the belief that if you haven't played a sport to a certain level, you won't be able to coach it. I asked Emma Hayes, the hugely successful manager of Chelsea Women, about this and was impressed by the response she says she always gives when she's asked that question. Do you really have to have a lot of frequent air miles to be a good pilot? Do you have to be a fantastic student to be a great teacher? Do you have to be a really good patient with multiple surgeries to be a good surgeon? Do you have to be frugal with money to be a great banker? Of course experiencing something will offer insight or provide a valuable reflection for players because you have been in that arena You can relate to them, but it doesn't necessarily mean you're a great leader. I think kinesthetically, it's important within your coaching teams to have somebody who's played the game at the same level as the players. Someone who's been in the arena is crucial. Is it a number one prerequisite to being a manager? 
No, I think it's desirable, but I don't think it's essential. On the other side, there is often an assumption in sport that if you've played at an elite level, you will automatically make a fantastic coach. Many female coaches in the US report that former NBA players are parachuted into the highest profile coaching roles over talented female coaches with decades of experience in women's basketball and winning records. As former WNBA coach Cheryl Reeve reflects in the documentary Game On, Women Can Coach, your qualifications weren't viewed as the same as male counterparts. There was a long time in our league that it was viewed that a former NBA player would be a better option than someone who had lived a career in women's basketball. The same might be said of the appointment of Phil Neville as the manager of the England women's football team in 2018. I've been told that there were some incredibly talented international female coaches who had applied but had not even been called for interview when they heard that Phil Neville had been offered the job. Phil was a former professional footballer whose appointment was undoubtedly good for the profile of women's football in the UK, but who had never coached a women's football team in his life. Clearly, his profile helped the women's game. But was that reason enough to justify his appointment over other, potentially much better experienced women? There's undoubtedly a huge amount of sexism in the world of coaching both from the men working in sport and inherent in the system. Women working in strength and conditioning also face enormous barriers to working in men's sport. In the National Collegiate Athletic Association, which is the biggest employer in sport in the USA, only a tiny fraction of s c coaches are female. In a powerful interview on the Pacey Performance Podcast in 2020, Sophia Nymphius, a senior s c coach and professor of human performance at Edith Cohen University, shared some moving insights into being a female in such a male-dominated industry. You have to not just be good, but you have to constantly defend yourself and constantly be on your toes. You walk into a room and the assumption is you are not good. And then you have to fight from the assumption of not good to get the almost backhanded compliment of, wow, you really surprised me, you know your stuff. And you know how many people say that and they think they are being genuinely supportive. I'd rather you just be an arsehole and say, there's no way I would previously have listened to you. Just say that. Don't give me the backhanded compliment of, wow, you surprised me. What was surprising about that? I have no idea. Sophia also points out that while much great work is being done to support women coming into the sector and to celebrate role models, no one is taking responsibility for the fact that we have a system that perpetuates these biases. They think the solution is to fix the women, she says. Stop trying to fix me and start to fix the system. Another reason women are sometimes prevented from coaching in men's sport is the concern that women might be a distraction to the male athletes. Seriously. This is a huge societal issue that needs to be addressed, that we excuse men for their behaviour because they cannot control their urges around women. Is it any wonder that women are leaving coaching when a recent study on the lack of female football coaches in the UK by Beth Clarkson at the University of Portsmouth, found that at every level women talked about football culture being male-dominated and all said they had routinely experienced sexism. Aside from the sexist banter these women experienced from men trying to assert their dominance, they talked of being given access to fewer resources, pitches, kit, etc., if they coached female teams, and were often appointed to less obviously desirable roles, such as coaching the younger age groups. Male-dominated coaching courses were seen as intimidating and uncomfortable, with all the women involved in the research reporting gender stereotyping. One head coach 
for a men's team arrived to give a pre-game talk in her first week to be asked by the players if she was there to clean their boots or wash their kit. On a more positive note, women coaching at elite levels of senior football said the culture is improving and they felt a greater level of acceptance from male colleagues. Beth also reported a move away from a one-size-fits-all approach to women's coaching with initiatives like 21 for 21 providing tailored mentoring and support for 21 women ahead of the UEFA Women's Euros, now to be held in 2022. In a similar move to help address the lack of female coaches in rugby in the elite women's and men's game, World Rugby have funded 12 coaching internships for women ahead of the Rugby World Cup in New Zealand in 2022. All nations competing in the tournament were able to nominate a coach to join their staff. Katie Sadlier at World Rugby explained, At the end of the World Cup, there will be 12 more women who can say on their CV that they have coached at a World Cup. It's one of the barriers some women have in terms of getting head coach roles. You get into that chicken and egg situation where they can't get the job because they don't have the experience and they can't get the experience so they can't get the job. With ambitious targets for the future, World Rugby hopes that 40% of all coaching staff at the 2025 Rugby World Cup will be female. One of the main reasons women don't progress in elite coaching comes down to family life. Performance directors and high-level coaches can be away from home for weeks at a time, 300 away nights a year for some sports, travelling overseas with teams for training camps and championships. While we're definitely seeing a shift in households, with more men getting involved with childcare and housework, Women still take on the majority of this work and more women stay at home to care for children and ageing parents. I asked Sally Mundy about this, just as she left her role as CEO of England Hockey to take on leadership of UK sport. From a hockey perspective, we see a lot of male coaches moving into the talented space and moving up the ladder when they're in their late 20s and early 30s. And this might not be a particularly popular thing to say, but a lot of women are choosing to have children in that window. So, at the time when we are seeing a lot of men come in and move up, sometimes women are having children. There are huge demands in elite coaching. For any woman who wants to have a demanding career, whether it is in coaching or anything else, alongside having a young family, You've got to really want to do it. Should the sports be doing more to make this possible? I think we, as employers and leaders, have to make it as easy as possible for women to be able to do both and not difficult. We've got to try and remove the barriers that are there. But even if you remove all the barriers, even if you do all the things around childcare and flexible time, all of that, That still doesn't make it easy. It's still tough to do. Creating a more family-friendly environment for coaches will ultimately be better for women and men. After all, it's not just women who want better balance in their working and family lives. I asked Judy Murray, former Fed Cup coach and mother of Jamie and Andy, why so few women on the WTA Tour have female coaches. The tennis circuit is pretty much 11 months of the year. It's tough to be on the road for that amount of time, whether you're a male or female coach. Traditionally, if women want to have families, it's very, very tough to leave your child at home or take your child with you. It's almost impossible. It's also very expensive. In an individual sport, you're responsible for all your own costs. So you have to pay for your coach, your coach's expenses, your fitness trainer. Very few are able to afford the entourage, but the ones at the top of the game can. If you're a player on the middle level or getting close to the top 30, you probably haven't got the luxury financially of being able to pay for a physio, a fitness trainer and a coach on the road. 
So often, the choice of coach comes down to someone who can also operate as a hitting partner and do some of the fitness training as well. As a hitting partner, you are far more likely to find men who have been at a reasonable level who are closer to women at a good level. And that goes against female coaches on the road as well. If you ask me to go on the road with an elite female player now, there is no chance I'd be able to hit with them. I'd never really considered this as a blocker for more female coaches in tennis. But Judy does think there's a solution in the WTA Tour providing a list of hitting partners at every venue. They could create that with local players, male or female, and you just draw from that in the way that you do for the physio rotor or the lifestyle rotor. It is a service that's provided. That might encourage more women to take on female coaches. The perception of what makes a good coach also needs to change as more women are promoted into elite roles in sport. As the sporting world reels from the stories of gymnasts, athletes and swimmers who are mistreated by dominant, aggressive, bullying coaches with a win-at-all-costs mentality, it's time we promoted a more empathetic, supportive style of leadership, a more participant-centred coaching approach that considers the well-being of the athlete beyond their performing lives. That said, we also need to challenge the myth that women are soft, caring and maternal. Having more women in coaching and changing what we see as best practice in coaching are interrelated, but not the same. Not all female coaches are stereotypically nurturing and feminine in their approach. Not all men are dominant and aggressive. This common gender stereotyping means that female coaches are seen as great for grassroots sport, especially working with young athletes. But once the job is no longer about nurturing and becomes all about performance and winning, a more masculine skill set is called for with more authority, discipline and strategy. Dr Nicole Lavoie, director at the Tucker Centre, says, When we think about what it means to be a coach, you're loud, you're in control, you have authority, people take your direction, you make decisions. These are behaviours that are stereotypically associated with men and masculinity. So what it means to coach already privileges men. So when women coach, they have to have behaviours that look like men stereotypically. If you conform to a traditional female role, where you are caring and kind and nurturing, then you're perceived as being too nice and incompetent. Men in the coaching profession just don't have to walk that same line in order to be perceived as competent and relevant. Raising the profile of successful female coaches like Mel Marshall is important to encourage women to see there is a pathway in elite coaching. A highly decorated international swimmer herself In 2018, Mel was named International Swim Coach of the Year, having coached the current Olympic, World, European and Commonwealth champion, Adam Peaty. Watching a passionate Tracy Neville coach the England women to Commonwealth gold in 2018 would have inspired thousands of young netballers to consider coaching in the future. Just as the appointment of Australian Lisa Keithley as the first full-time female head coach of the England women's team will do in cricket. In 2020, a female coach making an enormous impact was Katie Sowers, the first woman to coach at a Super Bowl, who in the process changed the perceptions of women's capabilities in the minds of millions of Americans. An offensive assistant coach with the San Francisco 49ers Katie was the second ever full-time coach in the NFL and the first openly gay coach. I am willing and happy to be a trailblazer because I know that other women, other young girls are watching this and maybe their path seems a little clearer now, Katie said at the time. In a powerful tweet, she added, If your daughter has a dream of being a football coach in the NFL or a ballerina, or a professional soccer player, or a teacher, or a nurse, or a doctor, or an astronaut, or even president. 
just let her know this. She can do it. And she will change the world. In researching the many challenges facing female sports coaches, an area that shocked me that I'd never really considered before was how a woman's sexual orientation could dramatically limit her opportunities. Perhaps it's an unspoken barrier in the UK, but in the more conservative US, homophobia also remains an incredibly powerful deterrent to women from joining or remaining in coaching positions. Until recently, some US college sports teams had policies that banned them from recruiting coaches who weren't heterosexual. The story of how Katie Sowers came to be coaching in the NFL rather than basketball, the sport she'd formerly played, is heartbreaking, yet fairly typical in the US, it turns out. Katie asked about becoming a volunteer assistant coach at her college women's basketball team, but was turned down because she was openly gay. With coaching being my final destination, I thought it would be natural to ask if I could be a volunteer assistant coach. And my coach called me in, and he said they have had a lot of parents that have been worried about their daughters being around someone who is gay, she told NBC Sports Bay Area. So that's not something that they would want around the team. So he asked that I would not be around the team anymore. I was near tears. He gave me a hug and he said, it's nothing personal. And I remember hugging him but being extremely upset. It was just something that I grieved about for a while, but I decided that I had to move on. As Katie's profile rocketed in 2020 as the first woman coach at a Super Bowl, the president of her former college responded, Sadly, in 2009, our policies and the laws of Indiana allowed for hiring decisions to consider sexual orientation. I am glad that Goshen College adopted a new non-discrimination policy in 2015. Even today, many women working as sports coaches feel they can't be their authentic selves and choose to hide their sexual orientation. So while women's sport is an incredibly inclusive environment for participants, That's not the case when those same women want to progress into coaching at the end of their playing careers. So why should sports want to encourage more women into leadership roles as coaches and officials? As I've already said, in all areas of business, diversity leads to success. Clubs and teams that do not consider female managers are missing out on considerable talent by ignoring half the population. In a 2019 New York Times article entitled Where Are All the Women Coaches? Lindsay Krauss explained that just as businesses have shown they can be more successful and profitable with diverse teams, so sports can have more success by including the other half of the population and leveraging their talents. Women need to be twice as good, often while working twice as hard, to stay in the game. A lot of women leave. And when you let an entire category of people disappear from your talent pool, everyone suffers. She continues, Adding women to leadership roles improves the overall performance of a team across fields. According to a Harvard study, gender-balanced teams perform better than male-dominated teams. A 2019 Harvard Business Review study found that women outscored men on 17 of the 19 capabilities that differentiate excellent leaders from average or poor ones. Female coaches and officials are also excellent role models for girls and boys in sport. It's inspiring for young girls to see women in positions of leadership and authority and also good for young men to have the confidence to take direction from strong women. Ednisha Curry, the only woman coaching in US College Division I men's basketball, says, What we're doing here at the University of Maine is really, really special. Empowering these young men to have the confidence to work with strong alpha women. When they go into the workforce, they're going to work with women. 
we've seen a little bit of a needle moving. In her book, Women in Sports Coaching, Dr Lavoie shares the many reasons female coaches matter. Women in coaching roles help challenge gender stereotypes about leaders in business. They help other women see how to navigate the workplace as a minority. Women that have been coached by women are more likely to become coaches themselves. Women bring different perspectives to culture and decision making. They advocate more for equality. Women coaches are visible and powerful reminders for men and boys that women can be successful leaders worthy of respect and admiration. Discrimination, abuse and harassment are less likely with a gender-balanced workforce. While seeing more women coaching in men's sport is certainly something we should aspire to, it shouldn't be the only measure of success for female coaches. This was clearly illustrated in early 2021, when the British media made much of the fact that Emma Hayes, manager of Chelsea Women, was being linked to a vacancy at AFC Wimbledon, a club in the third tier of the men's English football league system. It would have made Emma the most senior woman in a coaching role in the male football pyramid, and there was an assumption by many that she would take it if offered because it was in the men's game. Emma, however, quickly pointed out that it was an insult to suggest it would be a step up for her to take the Wimbledon role. She went on to explain that she had no intention of leaving her job at Chelsea, where, with a squad that included some of the world's finest female players, she had won three FA WSL titles and two Women's FA Cups. Emma told the media, I'm in the best job in the world. No amount of money is going to tempt me away from that. I asked Liz Nicholl, the former CEO of UK Sport, why she thought we still have so few elite female coaches and performance directors. And she was very honest in her response. That would be one of my disappointments. I haven't been able to crack that one but we do know more about why. Liz explained that at recent world-class performance conferences, she had invited female attendees to gather and share what they felt about the opportunities they have and what the blockers might be. Here's what she heard. Firstly, they wanted to see more role models of women that have succeeded in achieving significant roles in performance sport. Secondly. They wanted more networking opportunities to be coordinated and enable them to share their experiences with other women in similar circumstances. Thirdly, there was a view that some of the appointment panels, selection panels, were male-dominated and could that be addressed? In November 2020, UK Sport announced a new leadership programme as part of a bold plan to more than double the representation of female coaches in the Olympic and Paralympic high-performance community by Paris 2024. The scheme will see six of the best female coaches in the UK offering support and development opportunities for the next aspiring generation of elite female coaches. Paula Dunn, para-athletics, Kate Howey, judo, Mel Marshall, swimming, Bex Milnes, paratriathlon and Tracy Whitaker-Smith trampolining will offer a unique opportunity for coaches to observe them working and develop understanding of high-performance coaching. Karen Brown, Great Britain hockey and England hockey coach for 15 years, will be a mentor for the programme. Commenting on the plans, CEO Sally Mundy said, UK Sport is determined to see greater diversity across the high-performance community and this programme will focus on seeing more women at the top end of high performance. Coaches, alongside athletes, are at the heart of our high performance community. And we firmly believe that a more diverse cohort of highly skilled coaches will help more of our Olympic and Paralympic athletes realise their potential. There are currently far too few female coaches operating at the highest level of performance and we are committed 
to addressing this reality and working with our stakeholders, driving the change we want to see. Thank you so much for listening to the serialization of my book, Game On, The Unstoppable Rise of Women's Sport. If you'd like a copy, it's available in hardback and paperback in all good bookshops and online. The Game Changers podcast is free to listen to on all podcast platforms. Head over to fearlesswomen.co.uk to find out more about all of the incredible game changers I've spoken to in previous series. There are over a hundred of them, including elite athletes, journalists, coaches, scientists, broadcasters and CEOs. As well as listening to all the episodes on the website, you can find out more about the Women's Sport Collective, a free, inclusive network for all women working in sport. And you can register for the Fearless Women newsletter, a weekly review of the global developments in women's sport. Do come and say hello on social media, where you'll find me on LinkedIn, Instagram and Twitter at Sue Anstis. Finally, if you've enjoyed the podcast, I'd be so grateful if you could do two things. Firstly, if you could leave a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, I'd really appreciate it. And secondly, if there's anyone in your life, at home or at work, who you think might enjoy the podcast, please do let them know about it and help us spread the word about women's sport and the stories of these incredible game changers.